prayed, and everybody that's there say amen. 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 Acts chapter number 8, I'm just going to read the first eight verses, and, and I love uh, this whole chapter. To be honest with you, I've got it all outlined, the whole chapter outlined, but I'm just going to give you a few thoughts here tonight. The book of Acts chapter number 8, verse number 1 says this, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Of course, that's the death of Stephen back in chapter number 7. And he says, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word like that. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. I like that. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, and hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsy, and that were lame, were healed. Verse number 8. And there was great joy in that city. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for these great nights, these great services. Lord, it's not because of me that's made them great, but because of you, Lord, that's made them great. Lord, I want to say thank you for visiting us these last uh, services we've had, and, Lord, on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Monday night, last night, Lord, I felt your presence in every service. Lord, I want to say thank you for what you've done for me this week. And Lord, these people may not know everything that you've done, but Lord, you've done things in the hearts of people of, that's been here this week that don't even belong to this church. But Lord, even in the midst of all that, Lord, we've had visitors. <laughs> you've done some great works in their homes. Lord, I just want to say thank you how good you've been to us, and Lord, how you met with us, and Lord, I believe that you've revived some of your people, and just like the pastor said, he, he has a more fervent desire of prayer, and reading your Bible, and God, I had to admit, even in myself, Lord, I have went this week and had a more fervency of reading the Word of God, a more fervency of praying, Lord, you've disturbed some people's sleep this week, and Lord, they responded to your wake-up call in the middle of the night. Thank you for their obedience. Lord, I think it's been the key to the services each and every night. Now, Lord, as we come to you on this night, Lord, we realize it's a new night, a new time. Lord, there's new needs. Lord, uh, same people, but new needs. Lord, we're asking that you'd meet the needs of your people. God, I pray you'd help us here tonight. God, I come before you, just a needy vessel. Lord, need you to fill me full of the Holy Ghost. God, I need you tonight. One more time. Lord, would you just fill your messenger? It's all I am. Just delivering what you have for us here tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd have the preeminence, that you get the glory and the honor of everything that's done here. Now, Lord, I'd pray you'd just remove the distractions. Lord, you know my heart my mind's been pulled in many directions today. And, Lord, I felt like all day I've been two steps behind. It seems like I've never got caught up, caught up really. Lord, how it can weigh on me and distract me. Lord, I need no distractions tonight. Lord, we need to be centered in to thy will and your message and your time. Lord, I pray you just touch your messenger just one more time. Lord, if there is somebody here lost among us, Lord, I'm praying that this would be the glad night. Uh, one day you be birthed into the family of God, and Lord, we'll praise you for what you do. Help me, Lord, I do pray, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Y'all may be seated. I like Philip and... I've studied Philip as a personal study of mine since, I guess, January of last year. And, and this year has been my prayer that God would make me a Philip. And when I say that, I know when we say we like to be like somebody, it comes with a cost. You hear people say, well, I'd like to be a Paul, really. You may want to be a Paul, but you may not want to pay the price that it took to be a Paul. I look at the Percy Rays and says, boy, it'd be be something to be a Percy Ray, but we may not understand the, what he had to pay for how God used him and the sacrifices that he gave in his life. And if you've ever read his story, and 
his life story, Percy Ray was used of God greatly, but boy, it come with a cost for God to do what he did. And as I studied out the life of Philip, I have to say, it comes with a cost. But can I tell you, I, studying out the life of Philip, this is probably somebody in the Word of God I'd like to be like. And, and I've been studying him out and just going through his life. And if you go in the, in the Word of God, there's not much said about Philip, really. It's just chapter number 8, and then you run into him, I guess, I think, what, about 20-something chapters later, or around chapter number 20, and I think that's where you run into him again. And it's just a few verses about his life so really there's not a whole lot said about Philip but then when you study out his life there is a whole lot said about Philip and so I want to look at this thought tonight is there a Philip in the house is there a Philip in the house and we see here in verse number one and Saul was consenting unto his death and there was and there and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which at Jerusalem and I want to look at some things that Philip was acquainted with. Number one, Philip was acquainted with persecution. It talked about how there was a great persecution against the church at this time. And, and can I tell you, the church, and I mentioned this a little bit this week about persecution <clears throat> that's coming against the church. And boy, we're living in 2015, and our forefathers that probably went on before us probably rolled over in their grave if they'd known what's taken on or taking place here in America and the things that's happening in America and how the tolerance for sin has taken over in our churches and in our homes and in the society of America. And, and I mean, people would have, uh, I mean, that coach, I mentioned that coach this week and how he's been persecuted for praying at the 50-yard line. And just 15, 20 years ago, well, let's take her back 10 years ago, I mean, we'd have filled a football stadium full of people that would have stood with that man and says, we won't tolerate this. And yet here we are, we're in 2015, and people are being persecuted for praying at the 50-yard line. And we got people, and I was talking to a, a, a preacher yesterday, and he has a 14-year-old boy. He's a, been called to preach, and he said, I let him preach in my, in my pulpit just uh, a couple of weeks ago and to be an encouragement to this 14-year-old. And he says he's living a life in public school and he's living a life of persecution and he's being ridiculed for taking a Bible to school and he's being ridiculed for witnessing to people and he says pray for that 14 year old boy he's really going through some persecution for living right and boy if you had took that 10 years ago there would have been a pretty good sized boy would have filled up right beside him and says who are you talking to and why are you running him down and somebody would have took a lick in some way or another because of how they ridiculed that boy but here we are in 2015 and a 14 year old boy is being ridiculed for living right and living holy right here in a neighboring county of Madison County we're living in a day of persecution boy we're calling evil good and good evil and and of course Asheville is nothing more than a cesspool of sin and it still is today I, I just cringe at the thought of riding through Asheville, to be honest with you. And boy, we got some even some Christians in, in Asheville that's being persecuted for living right. And Paul and, and Philip, he was acquainted with persecution. And can I tell you, church, persecution's coming in America. Persecution's coming against the church. Can I tell you, persecution's coming in the mountains of North Carolina. And it's going to get worse and worse, I promise you. And and we've got all the things that are taking place and, and their attack, it, it's, it's, it's strategic. And what they're doing, they're picking out the churches and, and they're going through and there's some churches that are fixing to lose their whole building because they didn't handle a situation right. It's called persecution. And they're trying to silence the church. Can I tell you, that's what was taking place in the life of Philip here. They were trying to silence the church because the gospel was going forward. Boy, we see that persecution, it'll do three things in, in this persecution. And I don't want to labor on this point. I want to get to my last point tonight. It's really where I want to preach. But persecution, three things will happen in persecution. Number one, the gospel will grow. Every time you see persecution in the Word of God, it says in the Word of God, grew and multiplied. Grew and multiplied. Number two, the persecution will make the giving grow. People will get off their pocketbooks. Amen. 
They'll start giving financially to missions and they'll start giving to people to get the gospel out. And boy, I appreciate, I, and I'm not just saying this, but I love Brian Coates. And boy, he's a dear friend of mine. And I appreciate what God's doing through him. He's going to towns that nobody else is going to. And he's saying, I, he was telling me the other day, he said, God's just meeting the needs. I says, well, it seems like the church is starting to wake up a little bit under a little bit of persecution and people are starting to give to the work of God. Amen. Not only will your giving go, but the going will grow. Boy, people will start going and getting the gospel out. It says they were scattered abroad everywhere. That these ones that weren't in jail, it says the Bible says, and they were therefore were scattered abroad. Boy, can I tell you, we're, I'm seeing some folks, but it ain't the younger generation that's going. It's more of the older generation and my generation, and I'm not that old, but it seems like my generation and God's calling my generation, those that are in their 40s and 50s going out to the mission field and being called into evangelism and sending them all over the world to get the gospel out. And it seems like there's a fervency going on in these days. So we see that he was acquainted with persecution. Number two, he was acquainted with preaching. Boy, if there's ever a day we need to get back, thank you for that song, sister. Need to get back to old-fashioned preaching, amen. Boy, if there's ever a thing that's going to get it done, it's preaching. I mean, there's some uh, things. I know there's some great programs, Master Clubs and King's Kids, and if they're done right, they work good. But, boy, it seems like today we have traded uh, programs and fun and entertainment for the preaching of God's Word. Boy, we've pushed out the Bible. We've pushed out the preaching, and we've put more emphasis on entertainment and then we put more emphasis on programs and we put more emphasis on fun and entertainment and going to the roller skate rink and I'm not against any of that. I think you should have outings with the young folks but it seems like that's all the parents are more worried about. What do you do with the youth and where do you go with the youth and how do you handle the youth and somebody come to my pastor not too long ago there was a family was looking at our church they had uh, quite a few young folks and they, they had come to my pastor and they said well what do you do with the young folks on Sunday morning, he says, we preach to them. He said, well, what do you do on Sunday night? He says, we preach to them. He says, what do you do on Wednesday night? He says, we just preach to them. But you don't go to the bowling alleys and the games and all that? And he says, well, no, not really. He said, he said, do you have any kind of outings with the young folks? He says, we go to camp meetings and revivals. He says, we just preach to them. And we do have fun. We go to Dollywood and we do go to the aquarium every now and then, but it's more about preaching the Word of God. And boy, we need to get back just to some old-fashioned, fundamental, Bible-believing, Holy Ghost-filled preaching. Amen. The Bible says that they preach the Word. And can I tell you, that's what it's going to take. I mean, Philip went down to the Samaria and preached Christ. And you go further in the chapter, and he went out to that Ethiopian eunuch in the desert, and he said he just preached Jesus. Can I tell you what's going to get the job done in 2015? It's preaching that Bible, amen. It's preaching Christ, preaching the Word, and preaching Jesus. Amen. I, I like Mark 16, verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And boy, I got re re uh, rebuked uh, not too long ago. I was in a, in a meeting just like this, and I was coming through this thought, and I says, It doesn't matter to me. Where I preach, if God will open the door and give me an opportunity to preach the gospel to some somebody, I says, I'm willing to do that. I says, it doesn't matter where they go. I says, if I can just preach this Bible, I says, I'll be all right. We went to a nursing home a couple years ago, and it, was one, it, wasn't, it wasn't exactly, I, I guess, our stripe of what they were doing, and I knew it before I went. They asked me if I'd come and preach to them. I said, sure will, and we sat there, and my wife looked at me, and I'm not ridiculing my wife. But she, she looked at me and she rolled her eyes and I just said, just hang in there, honey. I'm going to preach here in about 10 minutes. She said, what? I said, I'm fixing to preach here in about 10 minutes. I may have to wade through the junk and the filth and the trash, but I said, just give me just a few minutes. I'm going to open up this Bible and I'm fixing to preach Jesus to this crowd, amen. I said, let's preach the word, amen. And I told that, that, that story about me going to wherever God opened the door for me to go preach. And the one man of God says, well, I ain't going to them kind of churches. I said, you cut your ministry in half 
staff if you want to. I says, I'll go to them. Just give me your calendar, sir, and I'll go where you won't go. I said, there may be somebody out in the desert that needs to hear somebody just preach Jesus. There may be somebody in the city of Samaria that just needs somebody to preach Christ. You may be scattered abroad, but somebody needs to hear somebody just preach the word. Amen. Boy, I like, I haven't gotten excited about this point like this ever since before I got this message. I'm telling you, preach the word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My pastor's been coming through 2 Chronicles. He's got five messages on 2 Chronicles 7.14, and somebody approached him a few weeks ago and says, that 2 Chronicles 7.14, he says, that's Old Testament. He said, that don't apply to the churches today. My pastor, the man of wisdom that he is, he said, I guess uh, Psalms 23 don't apply to the church today either. He said, that's Old Testament. So I guess the Lord's not our shepherd no more. <laughs> yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, amen. And 2 Chronicles 7, 14 does apply to the church of today, amen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, seek my face and pray, and turn from their wicked ways. Can I tell you, God can still heal, heal America if the churches would do that, amen. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I know it's Old Testament. It was written about the tabernacle, but I'm telling you, it's still evident and it's applicable to the day of the church of today, amen. Still works, amen. Boy, 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instructions in righteousness. It's still that way today, amen. It'll work. I mean, some people don't like it when somebody plows your tater row up. And I'm going to tell you, I, I don't like it a whole lot either when the pastor plows down my tater row. But I'm glad I've got a man of God that loves me enough to plow down my tater row, amen. I mean, it's two-thirds negative, one-third positive. You can't have a spark unless you've got a negative and a positive, amen. That's how you test them battery cables on a battery. You'll always see somebody go, and if there's a spark, you got power, amen. Amen, it works, amen. I think about 1 Corinthians 1, 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory up, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I'm telling you, I don't want the woe of God on my ministry. I'm just going to preach the gospel, amen. Sometimes there's things that we preach that people don't like. I believe in living right and living holy, and there's some things in that Bible that's straightforward, amen. And I like it. We need to get acquainted with preaching. Philip, everywhere he went, he just preached, amen. So thirdly, we see he was acquainted with prayer. He said, well, we didn't read anything about prayer. It seems like every night I've hit something about prayer, and I don't understand. Evidently, we need to get back to praying. When you get into Acts chapter number 8, you don't see anywhere where Philip got on his knees and prayed. If you're a student of the Bible, I, I agree with you. But I'm telling you what Philip did, you don't do that in your own accord. It says that the Bible tells us in verse number 7, it talked about how for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsy and that were lame were healed. You can't do that in your own self. This, this revival meeting, I really believe God honored those that fervently prayed, amen. I mean, God, I was, I've been praying about this meeting. God's took some sleep away from me about this meeting. God's disturbed my day. I fasted about this meeting and asked God to do something. Boy, we need to get back to just the old-fashioned fundamental praying, amen. Now, don't get mad at me. But one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to deny this old flesh. Amen. I mean, we bathe it sometimes twice a day. At least once. I hope y'all are. Amen. The odor only goes so far. But we, we indulge this old flesh. We feed it. I mean, mine, I feed it seven, eight times a day. You know, I love to eat. But it comes to a point in my life, and I had to change that. I mean, so, so y'all, most of y'all don't know me. But at my prime, I weighed 320 pounds two years ago. Well, God convicted me at the dump of all places. 
I went in a, in a dump truck. I was emptying a load of trash, and you got a way going in, and you way coming out. Well, when you way to get out, when you way to go out, you got to get out of the car, out of the dump truck, go pay the bill. Well, they got a pretty good sized scale, and there was people behind me, and sort of sensitive about my weight. So I got out of that dump truck and jumped off of the dump truck. And when you do, you jump off the scale. Well, it felt like God took that scale, which was about like this, and made it as big as the Empire State Building. I said, there's no way. So I got back in the truck before I went and paid, settled down, watched that scale get settled, and I'm pretty good at math. And I jumped back out, and God just did her one more time. And I just repented. I said, Lord, you didn't put it on me. I did. And I said, if you'll help me take it off, I sure would appreciate it. But see, I was having a love affair. Don't tell my wife, she may divorce me. But I was having a love affair with little Debbie. <laughs> she made good Swiss rolls. I mean, she good. She said, them fudge rounds, man, I love them fudge rounds. And them honey buns were to die for. She knew if she kept a man full, she kept him happy. And she kept me happy. But not eating little Debbie snacks ain't going to make you spiritual. But the route I took of it, I took it as a fast. Well, God did something for me. From that July and the last week of Sherathon and that February, God allowed me to lose my weight. But I took it as a fast. And boy, them times I get hungry, I just go off somewhere and just pray. And I read my Bible more than I ever did. God was doing something for me. God did more for me in them, them months and months building up to that. And God just did some things. But I'm going to tell you, the reason we're not seeing anything done in the church is we're still doing the same mundane things and we're still getting the same responses. We got to get to where we start denying this old flesh. And get back to prayer and fasting. Well, y'all got quiet on me. But the Bible says this only comes by prayer and fasting. That the disciples like, why couldn't we cast them? Well, would y'all agree it was different, different situations than they've ever faced in their life? They never faced anything like that. And God says, these are some things that you've never faced. And the only way you're going to defeat this is you're going to do it by prayer and fasting. Can I tell you, in 2015, we're facing things we've never faced before. I mean, things I've never seen. And there's some old timers, and I say that respectfully, that's been at it a whole lot longer than I have, are saying, well, I never thought I'd see it in my day. Well, we're going to have to get back to what, instead of saying, well, whatever will be, will be, and jump in a foxhole and pull the dirt over our head. I'm telling you, we've got to quit doing that. That's not working. We need to get back to prayer and fasting. And Paul and Philip was acquainted with prayer and fasting. Number four, I'll move on. He was also acquainted with the power of God. And we see that he had the power in his proclamation. He preached Christ. He had the power over the possessed because those that were demon possessed, they there was a they, the demons come out of them with a loud voice, but he had power over the powerless. Amen. Those that were lame was all to a sudden they were made whole. Amen. Boy, it'd be good to see some, some sinner walk down the aisle that's possessed with sin. And, and I mean, fit spiritually, they're walking a lame life. But boy, how God could change their life forever. Amen. Boy, I tell you, Monday night, God did something for me in here. I guess you say if there's a night that God did something, it was that night because as y'all were testifying, there was a somberness fall upon this service that night. And all of a sudden, we were thanking God for what he was doing and boy how God reared us up in this church and what God did for us in this church and all of a sudden it went from that to somebody said pray for my lost child pray for my lost cousin boy and all of a sudden the prayer request of being folks being lost it, uh, it outruled of us being thankful for what God's doing I don't know if you caught it but I sure did I said, Lord, I said, if we're going to see them people saved, it's going to take something different, amen. It's going to take some prayer. It's going to take some denying. It's going to take giving up your sleep, I believe, and getting a hold of God, amen. 
He was acquainted with the power of God. It's the only way you're going to get it. And I want to finish up tonight. Really, this is my message, and I had a long introduction, and I'll cut the message a little short for time. If I don't, I'll be here for a while. But we see he was acquainted with the persecution of the church. He was acquainted with the preaching of God's word. He was acquainted with prayer and fasting. He was acquainted with the power of God. But finally tonight, he was acquainted with praising. And I want to look at this thought. When Jesus comes to your city, what will happen? When Jesus comes to your city, what will happen? You may say, well, that sounds like two messages. Well, it really is. But when Jesus shows up, there's some things that will take place. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria. And by the way, they were just half-breeds. Nobody went to them. The only one that went to, to Samaria before uh, Philip did was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I must need go. And he went and he was at that well. And boy, how God, he laid that foundational work for Philip, I believe. He was laying around, I really believe. He is preparing the way for when Philip was going to show up in the town of Samaria. And he come down and he preached the word. He preached Christ. And boy, it come under the sounds of the people. They heard what was going on and there was people was getting right they were here and they were seeing the miracles which philip did there was a lot taking shape in the city of samaria and all of a sudden the bible says in verse number eight and there was great joy in that city and can i tell you when jesus shows up in a town in a church in your home in your heart wherever you may be i'm telling you there's going to be joy unspeakable and full of glory and i started to go through the word of god when jesus showed up in somebody life and what happened and boy it's amazing the things that took place in the times that Jesus showed up and I went into the book of Isaiah chapter number 6 and that's where God started me out at and I was there reading and I come down through and oh King Uzziah died and I'm telling you there's got to be some kings die off our heart before God will ever show up in our lives and boy we got the kings of self and the kings of cars and the kings of sports and the kings of this and the kings of that and boy we got so many kings sitting on our heart that God has no room and so King Uzziah died and he saw the Lord high and lifted up and they brought that old coal put it on his lips and oh Isaiah saw who he really was and he says woe is me for I'm a man of unclean lips oh Isaiah got right oh God he sent Jesus and the Holy Ghost all three of them were there and they said who will go for us and whom shall we send I don't think oh Isaiah says well there ain't nobody left just go ahead and pick me I was always the fat kid that was always the last one picked when it came to playing baseball and all that. I was always that one. Now, I knew when they were picking teams, I was always going to be the last one picked. It was always a guaranteed thing. And, that, and I'd sit there, and I was always one of these because I always wanted to be on the winning team, amen. And I'd sit there, and I'd say, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. Boy, they'd look over me, and they'd go down through that list, and they'd finally come down to the last two that couldn't play sports worth a nickel. And they'd say, well, I guess we'll take Robert Jones. Just come on. And they'd shove me out there on that back 40 somewhere. But I'm still saying up here, I'm not I'm just looking at God. Hey, Lord, send me when Jesus changed my life. I'm telling you, I want to go for God. Amen. Oh, Isaiah, I don't believe he was sitting there and says, well, if there's nobody left, I believe he was like that fat kid wanting to be picked by that, that captain. Here I am, Lord. Pick me. Just pick me. Amen. Boy, I thought about them three Hebrew children, and boy, all to a sudden, they were thrown in that fiery furnace. I believe the Bible says it was seven times hotter. And boy, they went up there, and they bound them old Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They cast them. The Bible says they cast them in that fiery furnace. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, he was watching what was going on. I don't know what was taking place in that fire, but they were walking around. All of a sudden, he saw that fourth man walking, which looked like the Son of God. Amen. I'm telling you, I believe old Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't moaning and growing and the moly grubs and complaining and the good Baptist pooch lip. No, I don't think they were doing that. I think they were down there having them a good Holy Ghost spell. I think they were having a good time in that old set fire that was seven times hotter said the fire didn't even touch them and they come out and the smoke wasn't even on them amen and boy I believe oh they were having a good time what happened in that fire Jesus showed up what took place there was joy in that city amen oh Nebuchadnezzar he brought him up out of that old fire and he got to bragging on God amen because Jesus showed up <laughs> I think about Mary when Elizabeth when Mary went to go see Elizabeth there in Luke chapter number one verse number 44 
Boy, they were in there, and old Mary made her salutation, and Elizabeth said this. She says, for lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in my ear, it says, for the babe leaked in my womb, not for sadness, but the Bible says he leaked in my womb for joy, amen. What happened in the household of Elizabeth? Well, Jesus showed up, amen. Oh, Mary, she was just really pronounced. There was Jesus everywhere in that house, amen. Oh, John, he heard about that salutation. Oh, John, I don't know what he did to Elizabeth, but old Elizabeth knew something took place in that old womb. I believe he's probably doing cartwheels, having a good old time. Why? Because Jesus showed up, amen. Boy, I think about <laughs> the shepherds in the field. They were out there just tending the sheep at night. Boy, they're just doing their job. The angels showed up that night and talked about the good things that was coming to Bethlehem. And I'm just paraphrasing for time. Boy, all of a sudden they were there and they said, let's go see and what's taking place. And they went over to Bethlehem. The old angels poked their head out, started to rejoice and sing praises unto God. Them old shepherds went there. I believe when they come to that old manger scene, they didn't say, well, it's good to see that. Let's go on. I believe they worshiped the Lord Jesus Christ. Them wise men, when they come from, that, come from afar, they knelt down and they worshiped him. What happened? I said, Jesus showed up in that town. Think about Mary at the tomb. Let me back up the thief on the cross. Amen. I get to thinking about them two thieves on the cross. Boy, what a sad day that was for those two. They were rightly being punished for what they, de they deserved. They deserved the cross. They deserved death. They deserved everything they were getting. But one of them thieves on the cross, I believe it was the one on the right. This is how I say it. The one on the right got right. The one on the left, it got left. Boy, that old one on the right, he says, remember me, Lord. Amen. He called upon the name of the Lord. What happened in that day? I'm telling you, the Lord says, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. Boy, God showed up that old thief on the cross. I believe when they broke their legs, I can't prove it, but I've often wondered. I'd like to ask them, did they break your legs first? Did you ask them to do you first? I was wondering if he'd do that just in case the other one might get one more chance to get saved by the grace of God. I believe he's having a time tonight there in heaven. Why? Because Jesus showed up and there's joy in that city. <laughs> and I think about Mary at the tomb, amen. I mentioned this last night in my message. And she went there so downtrodden and discouraged, but old Jesus just whispered and said, Mary, boy, all of a sudden she turned around and said, Rabboni, he says, touch me not. Boy, she was just having a fit, having a time. Why? Because Jesus showed up right there in that garden. And I think about the Samaritan woman when Jesus met her by the well and told her all the things about her life. The Bible says she went back to her town and she went to the men. If you go back and read it, she didn't go to the women. She went to the men. Amen. She said, come see a man that told me all things. Amen. Why? What happened in the life of that woman of Samaria? Jesus showed up, and there was joy in that city, amen. And I think about the two on Emmaus Road, and boy, they were walking so discouraged and downtrodden because of what happened in, in, in Jerusalem, and Jesus Christ was crucified, and he was buried, and they weren't around when he arose, but boy, they were walking back to their place where they abode. They were walking, their heads were hung low, they were discouraged, they were just sort of talking about what the transpired. Old Jesus showed up on the trail of Emmaus and come up beside him and started to talk to him. They say, just said, well, you must be a stranger. And they started to tell him some of the things that took place. Old Jesus broke in on their conversation, started back in the writings of Moses and started just to expound himself, amen. They constrained him to come into the house. He, they give him the bread. He give thanks to the bread. And when they give it to him, their eyes and their mind was opened up. They realized it was him that they were walking with. It was him that was crucified. They said, well, we'll go tell him in the morning. They didn't say that. They said from that very hour, that very moment, they went to the disciples. And boy, could you, could you just see them? There was a gait in their step. There was a hop in their skip. They were rejoicing over what they saw. They said, did our hearts not burn within us? Can I tell you what needs to take place here tonight? Jesus needs to walk in here. We need to have good Holy Ghost heartburn. Why? Because Jesus showed up and there's joy in that city. Think about the disciples in the upper room. Oh, after Jesus was crucified, was buried, they knew what transpired, but they were in that upper room because they were fear of the Jews and they thought the Jews were going to kill them. 
Lord, you're about to kill me tonight. And they were worried and wondering what they were going to do. And old Jesus, he just come right on in. They said the door was shut. <laughs> oh, I've been in that upper room. I've seen that room that they were talking about. It's just old stone walls and there's nothing there. And I looked and I tried to figure out where all the disciples were standing. What wall did Jesus come through? And, and I was looking at that. It doesn't matter what wall. All I know is Jesus walked in and says, Peace be unto you. Man, I'm telling you, God didn't rebuke them. He didn't ridicule them. He didn't throw them down to the dogs and says, Where were you when I was on the cross? You said you'd stay with me till I died. He walked in there and says, Peace be unto you. And the, and the word of God says, And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I'm telling you what happened in that upper room. There was joy in that room. Why? Because Jesus showed up in that room. Boy, I think about when Jesus shows up at a hospital bed. Oh, 2,000 led. March 3rd, I got a call on a Thursday morning to share with them. My wife called me and they said, we found your dad unresponsive. They've taken him to the hospital. And uh, I stepped in there and told Christy Johnson, I says, I got to go. I found my dad unresponsive. They're taking him to the hospital. And uh, jumped in my truck. And my dad, brother, literally, was right next door to the hospital. Right next door. I mean, I could walk to the hospital in five minutes. And I was driving and praying for my dad. And uh, I beat the ambulance to the hospital. I, figured, I hadn't figured that one out yet. I was 30 minutes. They were five. And I pulled in there and I was sitting there and I saw the ambulance pull in and run to the back door because I knew it was my daddy. And I looked and when they rolled him out, he was just nothing but a dish rag. His eyes were big, they were glazed over. No color in his face, mouth open. You could see death was imminent upon my daddy's life. They rolled him in in that emergency room. I followed in behind him and they said, Mr. Jones, I'll condense this story because it goes with another message. And they said, Mr. Jones, you're going to have to go. And I said, that's my daddy. And they said, you're going to have to go or we'll call security. And I said, that's my daddy. And they said, Mr. Jones, if you let us do our job and just go out in the waiting room, we'll call you in. And I went out and my wife met me and we were sitting there and they said, Mr. Jones, we need to talk to you. And they took us back there and said, your daddy's never going to come back around and spend what you have with him and just enjoy the time that you have. Because it's not going to be long. Your daddy's not long for this whole world. I went in that room and the pastor showed up. And I said, Pastor, my dad's going to split hell wide open today. I said, he's lost. He's going to hell. And uh, I said, I want my daddy to go to hell. And it was share a told pastor to go back. And he had Todd Bell. And he went back. And... Uh, Got at the foot of my daddy's bed, and I just looked up to heaven. I said, God, if you don't do something, dad's going to hell today. Well, I sat there and loved on my daddy, and finally I just sat down in a chair, just praying and talking to the Lord. The man that was never supposed to come back, I was just enjoying the time. And all of a sudden, his eyes opened up. And I jumped up out of my seat and went around to the left side of the bed because they had him leaned up on his left. And I went over on that left side and said, Daddy, I said, do you know who I am? And he had a mask on and he couldn't talk. I said, do you know who I am? And I reached down and grabbed his hand and I said, Daddy, you know who I am? Would you squeeze my hand? Would you squeeze my hand? So I loved on my daddy for a little while and Rubbed his old bald head and kissed his forehead. Just enjoyed the time I was having. And I said, Daddy, we got a problem. I said, in this room, we got a heart problem. And I said, it's a spiritual problem. And I said, Daddy, I've witnessed to you and witnessed to you. Time and time again. And I said, Daddy, you can tell it better than I can. 
I said, Daddy, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. And I said, Daddy, Jesus loves you. I watched a grown man on his deathbed break down under conviction and his chin started to quiver underneath that old mask. And I watched big old crocodile tears roll off my daddy's cheeks. And I saw conviction set in on my daddy. Conviction filled that room ten in the emergency room. I just stepped away from my daddy. I said, Lord, because I'll just save him. I saw a man under conviction and the countenance of his face change in just a moment, the twinkling of an eye. And I went over to my daddy and I grabbed him by his hand and I said, Daddy, you know, we've never lied to one another as far as I know. You've always told me the truth, Daddy. I said, Daddy, I said, I don't want you to shake my hand, but I said, if you ask the Lord to save you, I said, I want you to shake my hand. The man that didn't have no strength raised his arm up like a 16-year-old off the bed of that hospital room. He reached out and he grabbed my hand and shook my hand like a vice grip. Big old tears rolling down his cheeks, big tears rolling down off my cheeks, falling on his face. And I said, Daddy, I says, I can't do anything for you in this hospital room. I says, uh, you're going you're gonna to pass away. And I says, but just go home. And I says, they left a light on for you. And I said, God's got something prepared for you like God of this old world. They rolled him up in that old ER room up there. And them doctors, they come up to me and they says, we're going to have to take him to ICU. I said, I don't care where you take my daddy. And they said, do what? I said, I don't care where you take him. I said, he's doing better now than you ever saw him. I said, there's something changed in my daddy's life. I said, you told me he wouldn't come back. God brought him back. And I said, I got to have some time with my daddy. And I said, boy, there's a reassurance just took place in this old room. Boy, my daddy got saved by the grace of God. God showed up in that old ER room that day. And I tell you, there was joy unspeakable and full of glory fell in that ER room in that hospital bed. What happened that day? I'll tell you what happened that day. God showed up, amen, and there was joy in that city. I thank God that he can show up at the hospital room, amen. Boy, my mama passed away back in 2011 of last year, and my mama was saved by the grace of God, witnessed to a telephone pole. It was just me and her, and she was in there. She was unresponsive. She couldn't, she didn't move a, a blink her eye. She didn't move her arm. I, I was in there, and I took my Bible, and I just started to read the book of Psalms to her. I'd read a psalm and I'd sing a hymn. I'd read a psalm and I'd sing a hymn. My mama wasn't moving at all. And I said, Mama, I said, I know you're hearing me. I said, but I got to know one thing. I said, but if you want me to keep reading and keep a singing the word of God to you, I said, I need you to pull your eyelids down just as tight as you can. And I mean, I need to know, Mama, that you know, want me to keep going. My mama sat there and all of a sudden I saw her face and she had her eyes closed and I watched her do one of these. She said, like this. I said, that's all. All right, Mama. I said, I'm going to read that Bible. I'm going to sing them gospel hymns. And boy, I did that for about two hours, just me and my mama and the Holy Ghost of God. There was joy that come in that room that morning. I tell you, there was nothing like it. And boy, because Jesus showed up, there was a colored lady come in that room. I mean, she walked in there. And she didn't say a whole lot. She just said, I've come to pray over your mama. I says, ma'am, I said, you just go right ahead. She did one of these numbers. I mean, I'm being very respectful. But she come in there and she said, mm, Jesus. I mean, and she, she got hooked into the throne room of God. I mean, I was watching this, you know, this lady. She'd get to praying and she'd go, mm, Jesus, Jesus, amen. Boy, she'd do that. She prayed for about 20 minutes. I peeked. I had to see. I mean, I had my eyes closed. But this lady got hooked into the throne room of God. I tell you what happened in that hospital room. What happened in that nursing home? Jesus showed up, and there was joy in that city. Amen. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you. Oh, I'm telling you. Boy, we could go to the book of Revelation and talk about the joy that's going to be in heaven all because Jesus showed up. I'm going to end the message with this one point. I'm done. I was raised Catholic my whole life. Altar boy. Light your candles. Help them in the back room. It's wine, by the way, they drink. It ain't grape juice. It's wine. Water down. And I did all that. Part of it all. And uh, 
I met a beautiful, blonde-headed lady one day. Boy, she wouldn't talk to me for nothing. She was the most stuck-up person I've ever met in my life. And she wouldn't talk to me. Well, finally, one day, she talked to me. And uh, so we conversed a little bit. And I, I wouldn't recommend this for anybody. It's how I did it. And not being choking. It's just I don't know why I did it. I just did it. And I walked in her office, and I didn't say, will you go to dinner with me? I, I, or will you please present me with your beauty on the such and such, and I didn't do that. I walked in there, and I said, you are going out to eat with me at such and such time at 6.30, and I'm picking you up, and I turned around and walked off. That's how I, and that's how I gave her an invitation to go out with me. That's how, don't ask me why I did it that way. I, I don't know if she said yes or no. I just was, went there, told her where I was going to pick her up. Well, she was waiting on me. Still married to her today. And she's still waiting on me. Well, she was raised Baptist her whole life. She attended Hooper's Creek Baptist Church. And, uh, and so I just wanted to be with her. And so she invited me to church. Sure, I'll go if I'm sitting next to you. That's no problem. Well, this was before cell phones. I know, I know. That's a shocker. Well, our communication got mixed up. I thought I was meeting her at the church. She thought I was picking her up to take her to church. Well, needless to say, I'm at the church waiting on her. And I'm like, I can't believe a girl would stand up, stand me up at church. But she did. But she's waiting on me thinking the same thing. Well, that scoundrel, I'm his church waiting on him. Well, so I went in. Well, I went in and I sat as far back as most lost Baptists do, I get the same response every time I do that. That's so funny. And so I sat as far back as I could. Well, the singing got on. Well, I'm used to dignified, kneel, pray, quiet, don't say anything. Well, they got to singing a song about heaven, and I don't know what song it was. It was just about heaven. Well, I was sitting as far back as I could, and all of a sudden... This lady pipes up in front of me, stands straight up. Well, she leaned back, and I was like, well, what is she doing? Well, evidently, it opens the lungs. Because all of a sudden, this lady just started screaming at the top of her lungs. I mean, I mean, she just threw her hands back. She just threw back like this. I guess it opens her lungs. She did one of these, and she was just a shouting as top of her lungs as she could. Her face was red. I mean, she was just having herself a time. Well, I'm, I, I'm not from around here. I told you I'm a halfback. So all I heard about the mountains of North Carolina is snakes. And I'm being honest with you. I thought they were going to bring out a snake, and I was looking for the back door. Well, there was another man, while this lady's shouting in front of me, three pews in front of me got to shout. There was a man up here on the front row, got up. His face was beet red, and he just stood there and just did one of these for 10 minutes. And he did that for 10 minutes while they're still singing about heaven. Well, I'm like butter, I mean, in a hot oven. I just melted down in my pew, and I mean, I didn't know what to do. I was scared to death. I was frightened. I'd never seen anything like this. I thought the people were crazy. I was like, I cannot believe people act like this in church because I'm used to kneeling quiet, and you know, the organ and the pipe organ and all that. And these people are going crazy. Well, the more they sang it, the louder they got. And the more people they got, the louder they got. The more people were raising their hands, shouting. I mean, there was people running that morning. I mean, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Oh, I'm telling you. Well, I went back. And it was some years later, me and my wife got married, and it was at Fletcher First Baptist Church on a Sunday morning, November 1999. I was under conviction before then. I just didn't know what was happening to me, Brother Jerry, because I was raised Catholic. I probably should have got saved sooner, but I was so ignorant on what was going on. I didn't know what that meant when that heart beat. I mean, my... There was times my heart beat out of my chest, and Lisa would look at me and say, what's wrong with you? I don't know what's wrong with you. Why are you crying? I don't know why I'm crying. Boy, if I'd have known what I know now, I'd have got saved years ago. 
Boy, I remember that day when Pastor Roy Walters was preaching on the power of God. I'll never forget it. I, I wanted him to hush. So, and I'm being serious. I was waiting for him to quit. And when he said, well, let's stand, let's come. Let's everybody stand. The piano's coming. That's all he said. And that's all he had to say. And I come down on the left side of the old church building. And I just bowed my knee, and this is all I said. Lord, would you please forgive a sinner? And what did he do? He did. Amen. <laughs> and you know what's happened? Jesus showed up. Amen. There's been joy unspeakable and full of glory ever since that day of November of 1998. Oh, there's been some sad days. There's been some trying days. There's been some difficult days. But, oh, boy, when God shows up and God moves on your heart and he's moved on my heart this week and God has done some things for me, I've rejoiced. I've shouted going down the road this week early in the morning just rejoicing over the goodness of God. That Ford Taurus got tied a couple of times. God showed up. He met with me there on a Monday morning and a Tuesday morning in the control room at WGCR. I said, God, if you get too much tighter in here, I can't stand it, amen. I'd get to cry and get to weep and play it song, the Spirit of God start moving in there. I'm telling you what's happened this week. God showed up and there's joy in that city. Amen. And I tell you, church, what needs to happen? Jesus just needs to show up. And there needs to be joy in that city. And I tell you, these meetings, God showed up in my heart. Boy, he showed up tonight in that song, and the songs, and then they sang Beulah Land the other night, and I was up here weeping. I'll tell you what was going on. God was ministering to me, and there was joy thinking about just going home and being with my loved ones and then to get to see Jesus. Oh, I'm so glad that you can preach Christ and preach the Word, and there'll be joy in that city. Can I ask you, is there joy in your heart? Are you thankful you're saved? Maybe there's somebody in here you're saying, Preacher, I can't say I've ever experienced that joy that you're talking about. But can I tell you, tonight might be your night. You need to get saved by the grace of God and come experience that joy I'm talking about. It's called the joy of salvation. Boy, salvation will bring joy like none other. You'll get up a new creature and you'll be different from the inside out. You'll feel different. The, the sky will look bluer. The birds will sound, sound, sound sweeter. The day will be better. The, your life, your outlook, your hope will be better. You know why? Because you've got the joys of knowing that you're going to heaven and you're not going to hell. I'm telling you, I rejoice over that just because my name's written in heaven. Amen. Why? Because Jesus showed up and there's joy in that city. Amen. You got joy in your heart? You don't. Old-fashioned altar. Get that joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. Let us stand. Where's my pianist tonight? Somebody come and start to sit. Y'all got a song? Y'all got a song at all? Just bring, bring me a pianist, please. Just anybody come play piano. I don't care who it is. Just somebody come play a song. I just need somebody to play piano. That's all I need. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't want nobody looking around.